Thanks very much. And I apologise for those of you that were here for the same talk a few, well, an hour or so ago, because so it could be almost the same, unless I change my mind partway through and think climate change is not a big issue. <laughs> I don't think slightly. So um, I'll start by saying that the, the title is a little bit colloquial. I wouldn't usually use that language for an academic seminar, though it's actually fairly accurate. Um, so I do think that we are deluding ourselves on climate change, and we need to start to be more honest and open, both to ourselves, but also to, to others as well. And I say that um, that is occurring very much in the scientific community. Where we are deluding ourselves within that community, and I'll touch on that as we go through here. Um, I'm going to start off with an exam question. I mean, this is a university. Uh, can an urgent low carbon transition be a just transition? I think that's a really important is issue to think about. And in fact, um, I do quite a lot of work in, in, in the House of Commons, and one of the big issues there about trying to drive change is a lot of the unions have been opposed to it because they, quite rightly, they're concerned about the jobs issue. So this, this part here is, is very important, um, and we need to address it more seriously than we have been so far. So can, not should, um, urgent, how, how rapidly do we, make, do we need to make the changes, and can it be done in a fair way? And I'm going to touch on two elements. Well, I'm going to focus on mitigation, which is reducing our emissions, but I'm also going to just touch on the impacts, because that, that's very important as well. And on the impacts, it's a really quite a sad story, that we have to acknowledge straight away that even if we delivered on the Paris agreement, that's the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, even if we delivered on the commitments set in place in Paris, and there's no sign that we're going to do that at the moment, I mean, we've, we've all signed it, we all talk about it, but there's no sign that we're making changes in our, own, in our own countries, our own institutions in line with Paris. But even if we did, these people will suffer. They are suffering today. You know, the people who suffered from the much, much more severe typhoon that went through Mozambique, partly induced by climate change or exacerbated by climate change. Other species that are dying out at phenomenally rapid rates. Now, climate change will wipe out virtually all of the barrier reef. And to be really sad about this, there's virtually nothing we can do about it now. We've left it too late. So during our lives, the barrier reef will no longer exist as a live coral reef because of climate change. Do we worry about our own children? All these people are going to be impacted. Some of these people are already suffering, and many of them will, and many of them are already dying as a consequence of climate change. It's often exacerbated on top of other tensions and pressures and environmental criteria, that are, environmental issues that are there. But as we get higher temperature warming, one and a half or two degrees centigrade, and that's probably the best that we can hope for now, that's going to mean even more people will die. So from an impact point of view, it's not looking good. And it's certainly not looking good for future generations, because this is not going to be just the next 10, 20, 30 years. This is going to go on to our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren, and other species right across the next few hundred years. We are locking in a very long period of change. So that's not particularly positive. So but what I'm saying here is probably one and a half to two degrees centigrade is the best that we can now deli deliver, and that's what's locked into the Paris Agreement, what, we're, what we've committed to do. But on mitigation, on reducing emissions, I think actually it's a different story. Here, I think the Paris Agreement, along with the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's the big United Nations body that brings together the science every few years to say, well, what's the best science that we now have on climate change? And I think if you put those two together, then it does require equity, or just have equity at its core from the maths and the science, regardless of the moral arguments. And that, I think, is important here, that without equity as an issue on reducing emissions, we will fail, and I'll explain why that is later. And that isn't a political conclusion. You can come to that from a moral or political perspective conclusion, but, you can, but I would argue it comes directly out of the maths and the science. Now, I wouldn't have said that in 1990, because we could have done it differently, it could still be inequitable, but the later we leave it, the more equity becomes key. So just how deluded are we? And I'm going to just go through a few things around the UK just to remind ourselves when we often hear in the press about how well we're doing, and we hear that from the press quite often, sometimes it tells us how badly we're doing, other times how well we're doing. We hear it from the Committee on Climate Change or from government ministers, and often scientists and even some NGOs will tell us how well we're doing in the UK. Well, I used to, I should say, I used to design and build these things. I used to work offshore in the North Sea quite a long time ago now. This is uh, the Clare Ridge um, Phase 2 platform from BP. First oil was 2018, November 2018, so just, just a few months ago. That will be producing oil for most of your lives, and probably my life, with a, with a bit of stem cell research. I'm hoping to be here for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, but around about a quarter of a billion tonnes of CO2. Quarter of a billion, that's a huge amount. It's locked into that, and we've just gone ahead with it. The new Glengorm gas field, announced in January, to a big fanfare, 
discovery of the UK's biggest gas field raises industry's hopes. That's roughly another 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. I mean, this is what we're, what we're planning to develop, and other ones as well, over the coming decades. Well, these have been developed now. In East Yorkshire this summer, near Hull, biggest um, onshore gas field discovered there. <coughs> Planned emissions, 13 million tonnes. Shale gas, you know, big issue in the northwest. Government gives last minute go ahead to UK fracking. Look what the energy minister says. Extraction of fossil fuel will aid transition to a low carbon economy. It's just, <laughs> you can say anything and people will sort of broadly, t I mean, that wasn't by Trump. I mean, Trump might say that, but yeah, that was by our energy minister. And then we've got um, Christopher Grayling, who was the transport minister and thankfully he's now in the back benches. Um, oh, <laughs> he wish he'd go a bit further back actually. But anyway, that's different. Um, and he was uh, strongly behind the Heathrow Airport expansion, but, but then so were most MPs. So most people in the House of Commons voted to expand Heathrow. And like most people here, will look, vote to expand Manchester Airport. So we, we have this real issue here on something like aviation, which aviation is you know, it's beneficial to, to all of us to some degree, but actually it's driven by a small group of people who fly very frequently. You have people like professors who fly regularly. I have colleagues, some of them who will fly 10 to 30 times a year. So you just think, and there, was, there was just something out yesterday on the, on the new Lib Dem leader, Joe Swinson, who's, who's arguing now for a frequent flyer levy and all sorts of things. She, she flew 38 times last year. 38, almost once a week. Now that's not, I mean, it's not just her, I'm sure it's the same for almost, almost all of the other leaders as well. So across the board, what we see is the elites in our society flying. And then you see things like this. The Committee on Climate Change, who's the government sort of advisory committee on these issues, in looking at the total amount of carbon dioxide emissions we can emit over the rest of the century, if we deliver on Paris, says that 40% of that should be allocated to this one sector that, that was used mostly by a relatively small group of the people. So that means, that means schools, hospitals and businesses have much less emissions because we're in the privileged of single sector. So you know, things aren't looking particularly positive from that point of view. And whether you're looking at North Sea Oil, whether you're looking at shale gas or indeed um, Heathrow, what you see worryingly is, is actually this, the academic community rem remains remarkably quiet because we like the funding. We like, to be, we like to talk to the policymakers. And if you start to question these sort of fundamental things about trying, what they're, that they're trying to do, then it's quite hard to have debates with them because they don't want to hear those sorts of messages. Um, also, our funders, the research councils that fund us, these are not the sorts of questions they want asking. And there's a lot of issues here that we need to be unpicked about. Why, is academic, why have academics been so quiet about what's been going on for 20 years or so in the UK and elsewhere in the world. So it's not just British academics, it's more widely. Um, and if you think about the global situation here, carbon dioxide emissions have gone up by almost 70% since 1990 when the first report came out from the IPCC. And I'm guessing that quite a few of you here weren't born in 1990. So just, just hands up if you weren't born. If you were born after 1990. So most of you were born after 1990. The first reports came out from the IPCC saying what, we, you know, what the issues were and what we need to do about it. And people of my generation have, fun and that includes your parents, remember, probably, that we have fundamentally failed on climate change right throughout your lives. So there is a long legacy here of not caring about the next generation. And that's not everyone, but by and large, on, on average, we have been very unsuccessful. And the argument is often made, but isn't the UK doing really well? And you know, the UK position is regularly quoted like this. This is from the Committee on Climate Change, repeated in the press and also by many academics. In 2017, emissions were 42% lower than 1990, and they're probably going to be 44% in 2018. But what they forgot to do, deliberately, was to include emissions from aviation and shipping. So every country ignores aviation and shipping. It's like it belongs to another country or to God or someone. But, so no country takes that into account. Every country is trying to expand it. And in the UK, it's about 10% of our emissions. In Sweden, it's about 17%. It's 10% and growing in the UK. Um, but also our imports and exports. So that my computer was made in China, and then we blame the Chinese for the emissions, but I'm using the computer. So there's this, this part as well. So if you put all that together, the UK has only seen about a 10% reduction since 1990, not a 44 one. So a big difference. That's about 0.4% reduction every year. In other words, almost nothing. And if you look at other climate progressive countries, climate progressive, I'm not sure they are, but you know, Denmark, Sweden, where I work, um, and France, which are probably the most progressive ones in the EU, not those, those three have had no reduction since 1990. They'll all tell you they've reduced because they're ignoring these, these other, other issues. But if they include those, there's no reduction for the most climate progressive ones. Norway's up 50%, Ireland's up 
Belgium or Netherlands, I can't remember which one, they're up by about 25% as well. So lots of countries are having rise, rising emissions. And there's been a whole suite of what I've called here technocratic fraud. Um, so we, we firstly, we haven't bothered to account for everything. So things that are difficult, we broadly push to one side. So, um, so we have ignored aviation and shipping. We use a lot of offsetting, and the government's really keen on this over here, but they are also in Sweden. So the idea is that we won't make the reductions, someone else will. So we're doing that individually. You often see that in academic conferences on climate change. The IPCC do this. We, we had a carbon neutral conference. Everyone flew there and then paid some poor people in Nigeria to reduce their emissions. And then we claim we had a carbon neutral flight. So offsetting has been used and misused repeatedly. The clean development mechanism, which is just offsetting at a, at a state level, has been sanctioned for a state level, so within governments. And then this idea of you plant some trees, it means you can carry on emitting. And that's been used in Sweden, by the government in Sweden, to expand Arlanda Airport, which is their main airport near Stockholm. And they're, they're saying, well, we're going to plant more trees in the north of Sweden so we can expand the airport. So we're trying to, anything we can do to stop us having to make changes. And then very significantly, and, uh, and though you may not have heard of these things, these are massively important in, the, um, in how policies are being developed. We are, we are increasingly relying on this techno these technologies, negative emission technologies. These don't exist in reality. There's a few pilot schemes, but they're mostly in people's imaginations. You know, a few professors are quite keen on the idea of it. We don't have them. And it's the idea is that we will, that, that we, and that means we, that means you, the younger ones of you, will suck our carbon dioxide out of the future by some technology, I'm not sure what it will be, in the future. And it will probably start significantly 2035, but not really start going until 2050. And it will carry on across the century and into the next century. And almost every single scenario about what we're going to do about climate change embeds that in it. So it assumes that you're going to do that. Hundreds of billions of tonnes of CO2 sucked out of the air and then buried underground somewhere. You know, that is our main policy on climate change. And that's not just the UK, it's at the global level. The UK policy is already influenced by assumptions about that. But most of the modellers, when you talk to them quietly away from the models and away from a microphone and with a beer or something, they'll tell you that they don't think it'll work at the scale that's in the models. But they feel they have to put it in because they've got to maintain the current economic system, which, which influences, by what changes we, influences what changes we think we can make. And then there's this whole idea behind that of geoengineering. So if we fail on these negative emissions, which almost certainly we will, um, then what we're going to rely on is other things, sticking plasters on gangrene, as sometimes we refer to them as. So things like firing rockets into the stratosphere, that's the upper part of the atmosphere, to spread out sulfate particles in the stratosphere, which then reflect sunlight back into space. So it cools the, cools the earth beneath. Now, you know, th this is awash with all sorts of sustainability implications. It may not work. You have to do it quite regularly because the sulfate particles migrate out to the poles and then come out. You've got to put more ones back in there. Um, and it doesn't solve the problem, of course. So there are a whole suite of issues associated with these. What we haven't tried, the most obvious thing, is to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. So we'll, we'll do anything but cut back on our CO2. So we've got failure writ large at every single level. So um, the rest of the talk, I've used um, a, a, a lyric from Leonard Cohen. Has anyone here heard of Leonard Cohen? You know, basically old people have heard of Leonard Cohen <laughs> and a few others. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, it, I, I, well, I would recommend his music. He's, he's, he's a, more of a poet, but he wrote some fantastic music. And this, is take, this lyric is going to be taken from uh, one of his songs called Anthem. Um, and this, this, this is the lyric. Um, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. And I think it captures how I, or certainly how I see climate change. Um, firstly, ring the bells that still can ring. I think I see that as basically... There are thousands of things we can do. We know what to do on cli climate change. We're not waiting for some really clever person to say, do something. We know what we need to do. And we can be doing these things today, and we, and we have the economic structures and the technologies to do it. So there's, you know, just, just look at the sort of suite of things you could be doing today and starting now. So we have plenty of things to get on with. There are plenty of bells to ring. Forget your perfect offering. We've got a whole load of reports from the Stern Report in 2006 to the, to the uh, again, this is from the IPCC, but it's their, what they call Working Group 3. And that's the one that looks at what we have to do about climate change. Not about how bad it is and, and what's the science, but what we have to do about it. And I would think this is a highly political document. And I don't think it should be in the IPCC. And I think it's been part of the problem. Because it it, this is the document that feeds into negative emission technologies that you will invent will solve the problem in the future. So I think this is part of the problem. Then there's got the new climate, uh, new, the, the new climate economy, which is another one saying about how climate change can be solved. And we, can, and we have lots more economic growth and it won't be a problem. Um, and then we've got the latest report from the Committee on Climate Change um, in the UK, 
who I think are part of the problem overall. There are some really good people in there, but, but they're much, much too political. Than, and they sort of part, prepared to park the science because they've got to make what they see politically relevant. So I think they've been part of the problem as well. Um, and I think all of these smack of three really worrying trends, or two particularly worrying traits, and then an outcome from that. Firstly, colonialism, which we don't like the idea of in the UK, which has, been a fair, you know, has a history of colonialism, and we're just carrying it on here. We've got a total amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit at a global level if we're going to meet the Paris commitments. So then you ask, well, who gets what? And the assumption in the, in the UK's position is that the UK gets a completely disproportionate size of the, of the pie, a bigger slice, because we think because we're British. So, rather, so what we're saying is we want more of the total amount of carbon emissions for us, and the poor parts of the world will have to have less. So it's just a continuation of that sort of historical trend of the Brits and the wealthy get more. But beyond that as well, we're, we're looking to not solve the problem in my generation, the one that's caused it mostly, not just my generation, the one before and to some extent you as well now, but we're looking to pass it on to the next generation. So we're not going to make big, huge reductions. You are, the younger ones of you here. So we're firstly stealing the carbon budget from poor countries, and then we're saying you're going to solve it, the next generation. So it really is quite disturbing, I think, what we've normalised in our, in our sort of plans for climate change. And all of this allows us to sort of greenwash business as usual. So we can just adjust things a little bit, small incremental adjustments, and we'll solve climate change. Now that, is, that is not going to work, and we all know that, but we don't say anything different. There are some other really good things that are out there, or at least there, there are good things and there are bad things about them. The first thing is I think the UK deserves significant credit. Um, I wouldn't normally say that about it on many things, but here on, on climate change. It had an Act of Parliament passed in 2008, and it's a really good act, and it was world-leading, and I would still say in 2019, it's still, I think, the best piece of legislation. We haven't acted on it appropriately, and I think the Committee on Climate Change have let us down on it, but it's still an excellent piece of legislation. We could be using it now to really drive change. The Paris Agreement itself, there are lots of problems with the Paris Agreement, but it, but it has really tried to sort of commit us to reduce emissions in line with 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. Um, so that's a really important document. And then the latest report from the IPCC that came out last year, and it just demonstrates very clearly what the differences in the impacts between 1.5, which doesn't sound like... 1.5 degrees centigrade doesn't sound like much to most people, but it's a global average. And the difference between that and 2 degrees centigrade. And just to think, at 2 degrees centigrade, that's about 6 or 7 degrees or 6 degrees roughly in the poles. So an average of 2 means a huge change in the poles, so hence you get a lot more melting of the ice. It also means big changes in weather patterns in other parts of the world, including sometimes in the UK. So these small temperature changes have major global repercussions, so don't just think about them as 2 degrees warmer in Manchester on a cold you know, on a cold day. It's, it's not that. So there are some good things out there. We are moving in the right direction in some respects in our understanding. In fact, we have a really good understanding of climate change. So what does the IPCC tell us about the Paris Agreement? Well, um, just to sort of simplify a huge amount of work that the IPCC have been doing, broadly it's saying if you want to meet our commitments in the Paris Agreement, which is to stay below 2 degrees C, well below, and ideally aim for 1.5, the 1.5 was driven by the poorer parts of the world because they're going to be mostly impacted by climate change. But let's be also clear that these temperatures, a lot of people will die. So the, as I said before, it's not as if these are safe temperature thresholds. They're not. And we have to remember that. But they're probably the best that we can do now. But we have a total amount of carbon dioxide we can emit, this carbon budget. That's what we can emit at a global level, 650 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, which unless you're a climate change geek will mean nothing to most of you. But we emitted about 37 billion tonnes in 2018, related to energy this is. Um, so about 18 years of current emissions at a global level. But we've also signed up to resolve climate change on the basis of equity. In other words, take account of the fact that poor countries will take longer to make that transition. So <coughs> if I want to take that down now, so that's the global picture. If we take that down to the UK, what does it mean for the UK? And then we can say, what does that mean for, say, Manchester? So to limit to 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade of warming, we have this total carbon budget. But to do that, we need, we need to really understand the science and the maths. So um, I, I could have gone through all of this, but I won't. Because <laughs> that's all, it, it was all interesting stuff, and you have to trust me that there's some science and maths behind this. Um, and I argue differently that it's all about pies. Um, or in Manchester, perhaps I should call them Manchester tarts, because that's what Manchester's famous for, but it's, like a, it's very similar to a pie. Um, in Sweden, I, use, I have a picture of a bula in Sweden, which is another sort of pie that the Swedes use. But here, I'm focusing on this sort of pie. So we, we can emit, you can't see it there, I don't think. 
that's 655 billion tonnes or something like that of carbon dioxide if we just stick to 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming. And it could be a bit bigger than that and it could be a bit, a bit smaller. And that's because there's some, unscientific, some scientific uncertainty. Um, some people who are sort of optimistic would think it'd be bigger. I think it's likely to be slightly smaller because of the feedbacks in the system, like more, more melting of the permafrost and that sort of thing. So I think it's probably a bit smaller. But for now, let's just stick with what the sort of standard science is telling us. And then we have to split that pie. That's the total amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit out forever um, amongst every country in the world. So you've got to say, well, how much, how, what slice, slice should you have and what slice, slice should you, some others have? And of course, that's a big problem. And when you add together everyone's commitment so far, it comes to about three, three and a half degrees centigrade of warming. So we're not anywhere near one and a half to two. And what we've done with some colleagues here in Manchester and also some colleagues in Uppsala in Sweden is we've said, well, how big would the slice be for the wealthy parts of the world, the OECD countries? So they're broadly the, the wealthy parts, the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development. So um, how big would it be? And it's not a single size. It could be a bit bigger than that. It could be a bit smaller because you've got to divide the total budget. And how do you divide it? Do you divide it on the basis of population, on the basis of future populations, on the basis of the size of your economy, of what your current emissions are, what's your historical, historical responsibility for emissions? There are different ways you can split the cake up, if you like. Um, and so we did that, and we, we ended up with a range. It's just one slice of a pie there. Um, so we then asked, of the wealthy parts of the world, how much do the UK get? And we've also done that for Sweden. We've done it for a few other countries now. We've done it also for Scotland and Wales. We've done it for Manchester and for quite a lot of the regions um, in Sweden as well. So how big would that be? And again, that could be bigger or smaller, depending on what assumptions you use about how you split it up. Um, and that includes aviation and shipping, but it excludes imports and exports. And to give some numbers to this, it's between 3 and 3.8 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide for the UK, out to forever, again, from now, going out forever. Um, and again, that probably doesn't mean much to most of you, but we emit around about 420, billion tons a year, 420 million tonnes a year at the moment. So it's about nine years of current emissions. So if we carried on as we're going now, in nine years, we'd have nothing left to emit if we were to stick to our Paris commitment. So it shows why we have to come down so rapidly. And this is the same for all wealthy parts of the world. It might change a little bit, but uh, some, some of, if you're Greece, it'll take a bit longer. And if you're a wealthy, very wealthy country like Sweden or Norway, you have to do it a bit quicker. So translating this now um, from these total budgets to get an emission pathway about how fast we have to bring emissions down. Because the problem with the, with the budget is that policymakers will just sort of say, we'll solve it tomorrow. But actually, what it requires us to do when you do the maths for it is to reduce your emissions at very rapid rates from now, 10 to 13%, starting now, starting 2020 from our work anyway. Um, that's a reduction of about 70 to 80% by about 2030. So imagine your own lives and say you wanted to reduce your emissions by three quarters in the next 10 years. It's, you know, it's, not, a, it's not a small task. It's quite a big task. Um, and be fully decarbonised energy by about 2035 to 40, that's everything. So no, any, no fossil fuels in our planes, trains, <coughs> ships, refrigerators, cars, anything. So a complete move away from a fossil fuel based energy system. Now we should have started in, 20, in 1990, it's a lot harder now, because that's very near. I still think it's doable and I'm going to try and show where that is later. But you compare what I'm trying to outline here with the sort of greenwash that we've been seeing from the establishment. And that includes a lot of climate scientists for a long time now. We've always said this is going to be quite easy. We can just adjust things with a light carbon tax and some regulations and we'll solve it. It's, it's much harder than that now. And particularly for the UK. The Committee on Climate Change, the CCC, their total amount of carbon dioxide that they think they can emit is around about 8 billion, between 8 and 9. And then we're saying, no, it's nearer 3 to 3.8. So it's you know, a lot smaller. Their reduction rate is between 3 and 5% each year. Ours is between 10 and 13. So there's a huge difference between those two. And that's because they're saying we want a much larger piece for the UK and we're going to rely on future generations to suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So there's some really big differences in that. So let's go back now to the slightly more positive end of the talk and go back to Leonard Cohen. <coughs> Perhaps we should get the lyric playing in the background. Singing, sing it, sing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Perhaps, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, my question then is, are there signs of... Um, are there signs of any system change? Do we see any signs of the system actually shifting? Now, I wrote this a few years ago, coming back from a climate change um, event, which was really depressing, a big international one. And I was thinking about, across the board, whether you're you know, civil society or journalists or business people or academics, scientists and policymakers, you know, the whole way we're talking about this and the whole way we're framing the agenda is going to hell in a handcart. We are, we are not looking to solve climate change at all. Um, 
we talk about it in a sort of rhetorical way, we're deluding ourselves and we're deluding other people around us that we're actually doing something serious about climate change. So there's a, quite a famous picture of going to hell in a handcart. Um, and my, my question then was actually, is there light in despair? You know, I, I'm sat there on a train heading back towards Sweden thinking this is just dire. You know, I think we're going to wipe out most, or most ecosystems will be seriously destroyed. Um, you know, lots of people will end up being killed, there'll be lots of fighting, all those other issues that come with you know, poor agricultural yields and the rest of it that go with climate change. And it was quite depressing. Um, so I was trying to think, are there, are there positive ways to think about this? It was not easy. But so are, are there cracks in the system? So th this is um, referring back to that lyric. And I think there are. And I'm not saying these are good or bad. Most of them aren't. Well, some of them are good and some of them are bad. The banking crisis, the complete collapse of the banks in 2006, seven, roughly. Um, and then that governments overnight found you know, hundreds of billions of pounds or dollars or yen, whatever it was, of money and therefore resources to overcome that problem. They told us before there's no money. There's no money for schools, no more money for hospitals, no money for, for, for having renewable energy. But overnight when the banks collapse, we can find in this country half a trillion dollars, half a trillion pounds rather. So there are ways to mobilise money and change where the resources are. Now, we didn't do a sensible... We could have used that money to do something worthwhile. We didn't. We gave it to the banks and they squandered it. But, um, and, and as a result, lots of people are still suffering from austerity. You know, we may not feel it, but if you go to the north of Manchester, to Cheetham Hill, where a lot of you know, poorer or normal income people live, or some of the houses around the back of here, these people are still suffering from austerity. Some of you may be still suffering from austerity. So it had huge impacts on our system, which we're still suffering from 10 years later. Social media. And who would have thought 10 or 15 years ago that we would, social media would be so influential in our lives and that we get a lot of our understanding of the world through social media? And a lot of people argue against that, particularly, particularly people of my generation. We think it was better as it was before. But when I think about that, we always think that the past was better for some reason. You know, the media that I was brought up with was owned by a handful of generally of rich white men that lived in the countryside. So they ran the newspapers, they ran the television programs. So the news I got to see, and my parents got to see, and my grandparents got to see, came from the same sorts of people viewing the world in the same way. And I think with social media, we've now got lots of people having their input, making their comments. Now, it doesn't mean you've got the choice, as I was saying before, between um, sort of like four rich white men running it or 65 million nutters in the UK sending tweets. But which of those would you prefer? I think the social media is really good because it's opening up debates that you could not have before. But it, let's also recognise it's got massive challenges and there's a whole load of real problems with the social media as well. So it's not as if it's not without its real difficulties and it's, in some ways it's very socially divisive. But in other ways it's really enlightening and uplifting. It takes away hierarchy. You, know, you, can, you can argue with a professor. If you, are, you, know, you can be a university cleaner and if you've got a good idea, you can argue with a professor. You don't worry about your titles anymore. And that's exactly what it should be. It's the ideas that matter, not your position. Sanders and Corbyn. The idea Bernie Sanders stood in the States and got very near becoming the Democratic candidate, which means, he actually, some people argue if he had become the Democratic candidate instead of Clinton, he might have beaten Trump, because he's definitely anti-establishment. And the idea then you would have an American president who called himself a socialist and he wasn't shot in the, um, you know, in the campaigns. This is quite, quite amazing. It not, wasn't that long ago that in the McCarthy period in the States in the 50s and 60s where he would have been locked up in prison for saying he was a socialist. So it's interesting that you see these, these shifts in our systems. And then you see Corbyn over here, who wasn't supported by anyone, including his own party, doing remarkably well. Well, he wasn't supported by, he wasn't supported by some of the population, but not by the, me by the media or indeed by his own party. Who would have thought Brexit would have occurred? Go back 10 years. Go back six years. No one would have thought the, EU, the UK would be pulling out of the EU. And we can take our different views whether we think that's good or bad. I'm sure that I don't want to get in that debate. But, um, but it, we wouldn't have expected it. Who would have thought, and um, we can... I'm not going to make a comment whether Trump is good or bad. You can make your own judgments on that as well. But who would have thought that someone like Trump would become the president of the US five years ago? So there are massive shifts that are happening. The Arab Spring turned out to be, you know, not a disaster, turned out to have lots of people die. But it, it was a, this emergent people power, something that no one predicted would occur across many of the countries um, in that part of the world. The plummeting price of renewables. Renewable energy prices are so cheap and still coming down that they're starting to destabilise some of the energy markets. So there are still problems with them, but it is incredible how fast that the prices have come down. So they're cheaper than most other forms of energy now. 
and then a rise in the um, health impacts of fossil fuels and how that's been picked up even by sort of relatively right wing, or right wing organizations like the International Monetary Fund. So there's a whole set of things happening that we wouldn't have expected 10 years ago. And I'm not saying that these things in themselves are going to change the whole world in which we live, but these are really good signs of the system having cracks in it. A, there are problems in the system that, that lots of us recognise. Lots of constituencies are very unhappy with how the establishment has treated them. So whether you're in the Rhondda Valley in Wales with a breakdown of the mining community or the north of, northeast of England with a collapse of industry you know, or, or, the, or the dust belt in the States, there are lots of people, or, or the Gilles Jeune in, in France or the 35% or the, um, 30, 30, um, of unemployed people, young people in both Italy and Spain that are really unhappy with how the system is. And then new constituencies, new voices, wanting to hear about what, what could a positive future look like for them. So I think there's real scope here for mo moving from this sort of evolutionary shift to the system we're in today and say, could we bring these things together? Are there ways to, maybe not those particular ones, but are there ways to, say, um, tap into this uh, un uh, uh, dissatisfaction with the establishment to try, try and paint a new picture of a prosperous, low-carbon, equitable future? I'm not saying it's likely, but I think there are ways you can imagine that happening. So... Come towards the end now. Are there ways that we can start seeing, seeing the light get in, the, the final part of the lyric? So we've sort of said there are cracks in the system, and through those cracks is where the light comes from. So uh, Greta Thunberg, some of you, have you who's heard of Greta Thunberg? You've all heard of her. So Greta's a Swedish schoolgirl, now just 16, and I will express in just that I engage a lot with her on them and, and her family on climate change, so I'm sorry. I suppose she should, should be honest that, uh, that I have a lot of uh, sympathy with what she's saying and that quite a lot of her sort of science is based on the stuff that I and other colleagues do. But she's been very influential. In, she can communicate in a way that we could never communicate. She, she engages audiences in a way that we could never do. And she can say things with a degree of clarity because she's got Asperger's, which not, you know, she doesn't hide that, she's open about it. That means she sees things sort of as they are. She's not interested in political sensibilities. She's not worried if she upsets someone. They're sort of not part of her makeup. She calls them a superpower. Her superpower is she's not caring about those things. And so she can just say it as it is. And virtually none of us can do that. It's a real strength, I think, that she's got here. It's not always a strength. In this case, I think it's a real strength. And the school strikes. Who would have thought that school children would have a voice that has been far more powerful than all the academics that worked on climate change, than Al Gore and all these other people? And, you know, Al Gore and DiCaprio, all these other great and good working on climate change. The school strikes, these school children have been much more influential. Extinction Rebellion, I mean, it's only been out for a year and it's already having quite a lot of impact um, how governments are thinking about things in some parts of Western Europe. So I'm not saying we all have to agree with what these people are doing or how they're doing it, but there are new, there are, there are sort of shards of light that are shining up from the cracks about doing things differently, asking questions we could not ask before, opening up whole new debates. Those debates are in society, but they also allow us to think differently in universities. I have lots of early career academic colleagues who are now thinking differently about the challenges of climate change, thanks to what generally a younger generation has done in trying to drive a different agenda. So, you probably can't see that. So what, what real action then do we need to, to have to deliver on climate change? Well, Paris plus the IPCC, this is the one equation here, equals equity. What I'm trying to say here is that we, the equity is the heart of this. And that's, that's not normally talked about. In fact, I'll say it's still virtually never talked about within the climate change sort of academic realm or indeed the political realm. These are the emissions from people at different income deciles. So these are the sort of poorer people in the world. Look at the emissions in the bottom 50%. Almost nothing. You can't get these people to reduce their emissions because they're hardly emitting. And that doesn't, it's not just elsewhere in the world. Some of these people will be living in the UK. Some of these people will be living quite near Manchester, or in Manchester, perhaps. Look where the emissions are from this group up here. The problem is this group includes all the climate scientists, and the academics, and the journalists, and the, you know, and the legal profession, and the business people, and the policy makers. All the ones working on climate change are in this group. And so you can sort of see why they don't really want to change the way things are. 50% of global carbon dioxide emissions come from about 10% of the global population. 70% from just 20% of the population. So you start to think of the emissions are not evenly spread. And even in this group here, I could be wrong, but my guess is that amongst you, it won't be evenly spread. If you look at all your emissions together, probably somewhere 20 to 30% of you are responsible for probably 80% of all the emissions. So if you just look around you, you might see the people that are the high emitters. Um, and that's certainly the case with a lot of the academic seminars that I give. And you know actually who the high emitters are, they're usually the older ones. Because it relates very significantly to income. Not solely, but very closely to it. 
But does this really matter? Yes, it's absolutely key to understand how important equity is. And I think the climate change community has fundamentally failed to, to um, well, not to understand it, because I think it does understand it, but has failed to act on this in terms of its own research. Let's imagine we thought climate change was a really serious existential challenge and that regulations were put in place to force the top 10% of global emitters to reduce their carbon footprint to the level of the average European citizen. So it's not a huge ask, I suppose. Could you just be the same as the average European? The Europeans are pretty wealthy compared to most parts of the world. And the other 90% of the world's population made no changes to what they're doing at the moment. That's the equivalent of a one-third cut in carbon dioxide emissions at a global level. So you think just 10% cuts the level of the average European. It shows that emissions are massively skewed to a relatively small group of the population. And they're not all in the wealthy parts of the world. About two thirds of them are in the wealthy parts of the world and about one third in the, in the poor parts of the world. And if you put all of this together, when you look at that, we, we, we've, we've committed to one and a half to two degrees centigrade of warming. That's what we're going to try to hold our emissions down to that level. And we're very high on the emissions curve now. Emissions are really, really high. So we've got to come off that curve really rapidly. And so I think there are three things that we have to do about that from a strategic point of view. So three strategies, if you like. But it doesn't tell you exactly what the policies would be. I'm not saying it has to be a carbon tax or a regulation or a personal carbon allowance. You know, th there, are, there are multiple policies you might use, and they will depend upon your culture. So the Swedes will be much more accepting what government says, as over here we're much more critical of our government. So they'll be allowed to do things and, and, and implement things that differently to how we would do here. And that would be different to China, who might impose things in quite a different way. So the regulations and the, and the um, standards and the economic incentives will be different from country to country. But the overall strategy needs to be the same. Otherwise you fail. We need to get immediate reductions in our emissions because it is a cumulative issue. Every, every day we fail, the challenge is more difficult the following, late, following day. The carbon dioxide we emit today will be in the atmosphere for between 100 and 10,000 years. 20% of the carbon dioxide keeping these lights on from having gas-fired power stations will be changing the climate for the next 10,000 years. 20% of that CO2 produced today will be there for that long. So we are having a big impact in the future. So we have to change immediately our, our emissions. And that will mean profound changes in the behaviours and practices of the high emitters. In the near term, we also need to make sure that everything we buy is as efficient as possible. Cars, refrigerators, laptops, everything. And then we should also have those standards tightened every single year. So you have a real, cl real clear CO signal to industry, to say you can produce a fridge, but every year the fridge will have to be 10% tighter efficiency than the year before. And you see the opportunity now. An A-rated fridge uses between 60 to 80% more energy than an A++ fridge for the same size. So there's huge opportunities for doing that immediately, for big changes in new things that we buy. Remember, we do replace things quite regularly. If you look at toasters or laptops or even refrigerators and things like that, we replace those things reasonably, you know, usually anything between sort of one year and say 10 years, not untypically. And in the medium term, we of course got to make, and we just need to start, I'm saying we don't, we don't have to wait for this, we need to start doing it now. We need to um, shift our energy system from fossil fuel to something that's zero carbon. And those zero carbon options are basically renewables and the people are for against nuclear, but nuclear is the only other real zero carbon option, or very nearly zero. So there's, they're the only things that are really that viable in, in the medium term. And we've got to do that in about 20 years. Oops, I thought it came up, didn't I say that? No, for some reason it'll come up. And we've got, it, that takes us about 20 years to do that. We also need major electrification. And the big argument I think that's important here, and this goes back to this equity point, is that currently the labour and the resources that furnish the luxuries of this group up here can no longer furnish those luxuries, even if we want them to carry on like that. Because we need those labour, that labour and those resources to make the transition to this low carbon future. You start to think, what does that mean? That means increasing the size of your electricity system by a factor of three to five times in about 20 years. It means retrofitting every single house pretty much in, the Man in Manchester so it's fit for the 21st and 22nd century. This is a huge physical challenge beyond anything we can yet appreciate. A massive public transport network so you would never see cars again in Manchester. Within five to ten years there should be no more cars in Manchester. You know, people may have cars in the, urban, in the rural environment or for driving somewhere else and maybe they won't own them, maybe they rent them out or whatever it might be. But we wouldn't be using them in cities. So you're talking about fundamental changes. But there, there's some really benefits, good benefits there. There are secure, long-term, local jobs, high-quality jobs. Retrofitting properties is a challenging job. People have to be trained for this. It will, it will take sort of two generations. So you're talking about good jobs for a long time, not just call centres. Some decent jobs doing some decent work in our society. And that's a shift not dissimilar to what we saw in World War II. 
when we actually saw this whole shift in the productive capacity of society. And then it was for, it was for killing people and blowing things up. I'm not suggesting that's what we do now. But you know, we, we need to make this transition to, to a, 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 a low carbon future. Now that should also be a clean air future and a future where we all have better access to transport and things like that as well. But we need to be starting that now. And just to give a flavour of what this looks like, and certainly this is very challenging when I give these talks to policymakers or to senior academics or to senior business people, because we're talking about lives of people like me and them having to fundamentally change. So it's not fundamental change for everyone, but it's fundamental change for that top 10% and possibly the top 20%. So no more large houses. Can you imagine saying that to professors and vice chancellors? You're going to have to move out of Wilmslow where you have to start splitting your house into five flats. You know, that's what we're talking about, because if you don't split those into five flats, we have to build the flats and the houses for other people. That requires far more material. That means lots more embedded carbon. So we need to use what we have now efficiently. No more holiday homes. How many professors have second homes? Um, and no more prestige cars. We don't expect to see the, you know, look, you go to the quad, look at the big high polluting cars that are parked in the quad here. That needs to stop, needs to stop now. No more highly mobile lives flying around the world at the drop of a hat because it's so cheap. No more frequent flyers, no more business flights, no more first class flights, because those things are two to three times higher emissions, because you take up a lot more space in the plane, so you need more planes. So a um, big shift in these, th these things, and much lower levels of consumer goods, and a huge transformation. All of the resources going into doing those things now to make the shift away from a, a fossil fuel system that we have at the moment. 80% of our energy over that coming from fossil fuels. Oh, there you go, there's the 20 years, <laughs> in about 20 years. So to conclude, Let's go back to the exam question. Um, on impacts, we can't do this in a just way. We have left it too late, and one and a half to two degrees centigrade of warming is the best that we can achieve. I think it's gonna be nearer two. I wish it was one and a half, but I think we've left it too late. So from an impacts point of view, it is not just. But from a mitigation point of view, firstly, it is urgent. I mean, we, we look at the reduction rates we require, almost immediate, starting now, and almost immediately overnight, people, the, the high emitters, much higher than that as a reduction rate. So for people like me, and the senior people in our university and in businesses and policymakers, you know, rapid shifts in ways that we, we couldn't possibly envisage previously, but we're going to have to deliver. And at the same time, um, we are going to have to find ways to ration out our emissions because we've got a certain carbon budget. It's got to be rationed out one way. Do you ration it out on the basis of price or on the basis of need? So we have to think about that. So basically, this is, an, this is effectively an energy ration until we get very low carbon energy but that comes with a high quality jobs agenda. So I think it's very much more just than what, what, what some people would suggest. So I go slightly further and say that you, a, a just transition, a fair transition, is mathematically and scientifically a prerequisite of delivering our Paris commitments. Whether we think it's a good or a bad thing, I don't think there's any way out of it. We have to change, um, and we have to, we have to reduce the emissions from, from the high emitters. So what can we do? And there's a whole suite of things that we can do. Firstly, I think for us, us as individuals, we need to identify what our big carbon impacts might be and make some effort to change them. And that should be some considerable effort. And if you're a high emitter, then we have to make a lot more effort and, and be honest with ourselves about where those emissions are. But actually making the reductions ourselves, although that's an important thing to do in some respects, overall the emissions are relatively low per person. Even for the high emitters, they're reasonably low. But what you have to do is to talk about it with your friends and your colleagues. So you start a new debate about what is possible, what do we need to do if we really care about our children's future. All right, I'm, well, our own future as well. Um, so talking about it is really important. So we open that new debate. We then also need to engage within our universities, within our workplaces, within our sports clubs, you know, with our other wider set of friends and so forth, our local councils. So start to do that. You know, make our arguments to why we need to make these changes and suggest what sort of things that we should be doing. But think them through. You don't just sort of make some random suggestions. It's, it does require us to sit down and think, well, what are we talking about here? What are the things that we can do that, that are going to work? But also engage more widely than that. And it's quite easy to do that in a, in a sort of a country like the UK. Um, I won't ask here how many of you talk to your MP, but our MPs are really easy to talk to. They have a surgery every few weeks where somewhere local you can go and make an appointment and go and speak to them. You can email them. You, you will normally get a response. We may not get it straight away and it may have to email a few times. But the MPs in this country are much more receptive than they are in some other parts of the world. The ministers less so, but always copying the minister. Tell them about our concerns. Because they, remember, they want to know about our concerns because they want to know about our votes, even if they don't care about us. And most of them do, even if I disagree with them about pretty much everything. Um, most of them do care. Um, but they do want our votes. So if you tell them why it is you want, what you think is important, they know damn well that you may well vote on those issues. 
But also, so, so if they do things that we don't agree with and that aren't in line with climate change, then write to them to say, why are you supporting this? Um, why are you not going to do things that meet your commitments? But also, if they do things that are important for sort of trying to bring about progressive change, say so. Let them know that we support them. We n almost never support our policymakers, even when they put in really difficult, you know, make really difficult decisions. And that, that's a problem for them, because they always need to get people criticising them. They need to get people that are also saying, well, well done, I'm pleased about this. You could, you could have changed it, you could have done that a bit better, but overall I think it's a good thing. So engage with that as well. So right across the, the board, from our own, sort of own lives and particularly with those people around us, talk about changing that debate, through to our local environment, our council, our university and so forth, and through even to, at a national level. Ultimately, winning slowly is basically the same thing as losing outright. In the face of both triumphant denialism, like we see in the States with Trump, not in the States, but with Trump, or indeed a lot of Australia, or predatory delay, which is actually not really acting, but pretending we care, which is what we see in the UK and most of the EU, trying to achieve climate action by doing the same things, the same old ways, means defeat. It guarantees defeat. We are absolutely going to go to hell in the handcart on climate change unless we rapidly change our sort of way of thinking about these issues and our way of acting. And I think there are some really positive signs in the last year and a half that I wouldn't have anticipated before that. So there are some good signs for that. So going back to the final quote from Leonard Cohen, bring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering, there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. So on that note, uh, thanks for listening. listening. I'm just going to put up a slide here, which is just some, something I tweeted out this morning about the sorts of things we're talking about doing if we're serious about climate change. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. I apologise, that wasn't quite so upbeat, that one. The, pri the previous talk made me a bit more upbeat, and I think I'm probably getting a bit jaded. It's a hot, it's a hot day, and I've been indoors for a long time. Hi, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'd just like to take issue as an old person that um, uh, I deserve a medal for cycling for 55 years and not having a car. And Brilliant. No, no, yeah, you're quite I right. Know, I don't know, if it was more successful, maybe not the dick house and the big car. So, you know. um, but um, my point, my ask, a big ask was, um, you, you took issue with um, planting trees to offset airports. Yeah. And, and also, you know, I could tie that in with also offsetting with other countries. Um, it just, is there not a way where, I mean, surely planting more trees is a good thing. And it's not a, a, a sort of mathematical, you know, ten trees buys you one yard of runway or buys you, yeah. you know, an, an, another car. And, and the same with trading with other con countries. And it could be trade with others. If we get ahead of ourselves, if, if miraculously, yeah. you know, May gets back in power and goes, right, I'm going on big on climate, you know, um, and, and we got ahead of ourselves, could we not trade mm. them off with other people? Um, well, there's quite a lot in what you've said there. And uh, firstly, I, I don't want to criticise everyone of my generation. There's quite a lot of people who've done some fantastic work in that gen generation. But obviously, overall, our collective impact, unfortunately, has been really bad. But that's not to say that a lot of people haven't tried hard. But as a generation, collectively, we have failed. Um, now, on the trees one, I think the trees are really important. Firstly, these things always get become quite complicated. Aforestation is a problem. Because aforestation is often going to areas that have not seen any trees for a while and planting trees. The problem with that is that you often then the soils are not suitable for that. And what you'll get is you'll, the, in the, the soils lock in huge amounts of um, greenhouse gases. Um, you get a lot of me methane, a lot of um, carbon dioxide from how soils, um, from the metabolism in soils. You start to plant trees in areas that haven't seen trees for a long time, it may well be that those soils start to release huge quantities of greenhouse gases. So you think you've absorbed them in the tree. This is the problem with ecosystems, they're always complicated. Um, um, but it actually comes out of the soils. But if you go to an area that was recently deforested, often the soils are still suitable. So then you can plant in those, and that's a good thing. And if you, if you go to a lot of areas that, that we have forests already, they're often not in good quality. So the actually forestry management of existing forests, you can probably lock lots more carbon in. So there are plenty of good things to do on forestry, but not the normal one. Let's just plant lots of big trees out somewhere in Scotland, and that'll solve the problem. That may make the situation worse. But the next thing I think we have to be really cautious, and I say and we do do work on trees, and we work, talk to some of the councils, and in Scotland particularly, they need to do it. And there's lots of good reasons for planting trees from a biodiversity point of view and 
Yeah, I just think I think using carbon as a way of doing it, and then to allow us to sort of do other things is really dangerous. Firstly, if I try to drive somewhere or fly somewhere, the emissions are guaranteed. I get on the plane, I fly somewhere, you know, a ton of emissions are out there changing the climate from now. I then think, well, we'll plant a tree. It takes 30 years, perhaps, for that tree to grow enough to absorb the ton. So over 30 years, what do we know might have happened? Well, we may have had a movement in pests, which means the tree may be attacked and die. We've seen that already with quite a few of the, uh, with ash dieback and with bleeding canker for horse chestnut trees. So there's no guarantee the tree will absorb it because of the pest movement. We might end up with being chopped down and converted to firewood, which happens to quite a lot of trees, when it's back out in the atmosphere with CO2. We might see a change in the weather patterns, which means actually because it rains too much, the tree dies off because it's not suitable for the weather that we have, and it might die off and rot and come out as methane, even higher emissions. So I'm all for doing it, and we have to be very careful about what trees we plant but I don't think we should ever use it for offsetting from our emissions elsewhere. But yes, let's plant loads more trees for good, I would say for good tree reasons, sustainability reasons and biodiversity reasons. I'm all for planting trees yeah, in our cities as well. They're great in our cities because they keep, they, they, um, they have trans evaporations, they keep it a lot cooler. So in hot climates, or even in somewhere like Manchester, you look when there's a heat wave in Manchester where people go at lunchtime, they're, they're where there's something green, where there's grass and where there's trees, because they're the places that are cool. So plant trees in our cities as well, as well as that in the countryside. Plant science is our second hat. Okay, that's, well, that's good to hear. Um, uh, but on the offsetting, finally, on the country one, um, the, the problem is, I think, that the, the rates of reductions are such that we don't envisage any country having surplus capacity. If you did have, that would be great. And actually, most of the models, people assume places like Brazil will have surplus capacity and all the rest of it. But in reality, every country is going to be absolutely struggling and every sector is struggling. So I think there'll be very little opportunity for trade if countries manage to do 30% a year, great, let them, let them trade. But given that most countries are managing at the moment probably you know, either going up or maybe 1% to 2% a year, I think we're, we're a long way off the sorts of numbers we're talking about. So I don't <coughs> think that trade opportunity exists. But most people talk about it as if it does. If, if it did, fine, let's have some trade then, yeah. Right, great question. Any more? Yeah, Any question. Um, how do you convince everyone that climate change How, how, sorry, what's the first part? How do you? So how do you convince okay. everyone that climate change is an existential threat, uh, such that we get a response to this world review? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not saying I'm, so I've got to convince them. But, yeah, we all have a role in this. If we think it's a serious issue, we need multiple voices talking about it. So we don't want academics giving the PowerPoint presentations and slides. They're fine, but that's not going to convince most of the people. Yeah, the marches that we, we, we don't see them now, they're probably in town somewhere, but some people marched past here in the school strikes earlier. Yeah, they will have, you know, they'll be talking to their parents, they'll be talking to their school, so they're communicating these issues as well. So we need a wide constituency of people who, who, who um, communicate these issues a, 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 across the diversity of our society. If I wandered into the middle of Moss Side and start rambling on with a PowerPoint presentation, then, you know, I'll quite rightly be chased out because you know, what, what have I got to say that's worthwhile to them? So I think we have to be really make sure that our messages are culturally specific and we need a much wider array of people talking about these things. And that doesn't just mean scientists, that might mean storytellers and people writing you know, songs and, and uh, soaps for television and the rest of it. So there are multiple ways we need to communicate these issues. But whether we think it's important or not is a, is a judgment we all have to make. And we, when we look at what's happening, um, if you look at what happened in, say, Syria, for instance. Syria was clearly not caused by climate change, but they had 12 years of drought there. Those 12 years of drought will have seriously exacerbated the tensions in those communities, which would have meant that you had to you know, made the situation w much worse. And it would have some component of what happened there, which is still a huge issue within that part of the world, and, and even within Europe. But you look at places like Lebanon, where about a quarter of their population now is Syrian. Those sorts of things we're looking at you know, are, are being exacerbated or caused, depending on the level of warming we get, by climate change. You know, the breakdown of fundamental ecosystems. So that in fact, we, well, we lose the Barrier Reef. That's a real problem for lots and lots of respects. But let's imagine that people think, well, it's something you go on to holiday to see, but it has other ecosystem impacts. Just look in the UK, though. What happens if we lose the pollinating insects? Who's going to pollinate our crops? Where's the food come from? <laughs> so if we... Impacts on agriculture? Yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How we're going to feed them? Yeah. The increase in temperatures is going to have a major impact on our crop yields. Yeah. So from my point of view, the impact that one really scares me. Yeah. Yeah. Water, water, and insects, I think, are really big issues because we know we're going, we, you know, we know that we're going to see significant changes in the in in the weather caused by climate. We don't know what they'll be. Particularly, water. We know more about temperature, um, but and so we've got some idea of aggregate droughts and um, total rainfall. But we don't know what the rainfall patterns will be. We're really bad at modelling that. 
And that is absolutely pivotal for, for issues of agriculture. And we also don't know about pollinating insects. We're seeing this massive decline in insects. You know, they, they, they perform functions for us. I mean, I, like, I think these things should exist because of the beauty of them all. But that's, you know, not everyone's convinced by that. So just from an ecosystem services, which I hate that term, but people use that expression, ecosystem services. They, the, you know, the, the, the world itself, and whether it's the trees providing clean air, you know, they provide the environment within which we, th we live and, f and flourish. And we are starting to break that system down. So if we think those things are important, which is about our lives and our children's lives, then hopefully we can all be convinced. But it is important that we go out and you know, look at what's the evidence that's there and convince ourselves. Don't just listen to me. Listen to what other people are saying and, and build our own picture of how, how and why we think this is important. But now on the other part of your story is that I think there's lots of benefits of, of um, responding to climate change. It isn't for the very wealthy in our society. We're in a highly unequal society. E even in Sweden, when we're looking at there, we still see quite a lot of inequality there. But it's not like the UK. I think you are talking about a jobs agenda that would be much better for people living in Cheetham Hill and Crumpsall and you know, the poorer parts of Manchester, because they will be, have much more prosperous futures. So I think, and, and better air quality, because it's their children that suffer most. You know, the air quality always affects the poor, almost always affects the poor people in our society more than the wealthy ones. And that's historically been the case. So I think there's a whole suite of very good benefits to, to responding to this as well. So I think there are multiple reasons for engaging, but we have to, you know, we have to develop that thinking ourselves, not, don't, don't just listen to me. No, fine. I'm not. I'm not I'm just fine. Yeah. I'm, as many as you want, you can. Okay. I just with a refresh my water. I filled this up about four days ago, and I forgot to do it. And it tastes like it's four days old inside a metal tin. Yeah. I mean, that is a really important issue. My, my main focus is, is on energy. I don't work on agriculture. I have colleagues that do. I understand some of it reasonably well. Um, about 20% of the emissions overall, because they're different sorts of gases most of the time. Most of it's methane and, and nitrous oxide, so different gases. Um, uh, but they have a, and they have a different effect in the atmosphere. But overall, they're warming gases. But, and about 20% of the, the gases overall come from agriculture and our food system. Um, and they have about 20% of the warming impact. And they've historically had quite a lot as well. So they are really important, and we know what to do about them, but we can't eliminate them. So we can have zero carbon energy, but we cannot have a zero carbon food system or a zero greenhouse gas food system. Even if you put fertilizer on the land, even if it's organic fertilizer, you know, it's, it's, it's other, other forms, you know, not synthetic for fertilizer, you still get nitrous oxide emissions, N2O emissions, and they, they, that is a greenhouse gas, a really serious greenhouse gas. You're still gonna get some methane emissions. If you plow a field, you get methane emissions. Now there are some low-till methods and there are things like that. We can move away from certain types of meat, particularly red meat, you know, as I said before, I'm saying it to the last group, uh, animals with two stomachs, so basically sheep and, um, and cattle, that they have much higher emissions than, sh than animals like chickens and pigs. So you can, there are things that we can do if you still want to eat meat, but reducing the amount we eat, of meat we eat is a really positive thing. Firstly, because, or significantly, because um, of the uh, total amount of food that we have to grow to feed those animals. It's a very inefficient way of getting calories into us. There are other benefits in protein and so forth, and maybe some of the poor parts of the world, they need to increase in some of these, some of these other sort of like protein and some of the other nutrients which might come through a meat route. Um, but yes, this is a p key issue, and dairy as well in this. I, mean, I went vegetarian in 1987. I don't want, and I, but I, have, I have to say, up until a few years ago, I used to work every Easter at a farm on the west coast of Scotland, because my uncle is a croft, is a shepherd up there, so he had sheep. So he used to think it was really weird that a man who was a vegetarian was working on the sheep farm. Um, during Easter. Uh, so yeah, there, there are, there's nothing necessarily wrong with eating meat occasionally as a, as a celebration, particularly you know, some of these sort of red meats. But overall, we need to reduce our consumption of meat um, and of dairy products. And that will relinquish more land for, for 
for biodiversity reasons and more land also for food production. Because if you look at something like the UK, you probably know better than me, is it? But I think we grow 40% of our food in the UK and 60% we import. Now, you know, we may well have to be, we, perhaps we should be growing more of our food ourselves, but if we put that land to, to, to animals, then it's l much less productive from a food point of view. So think about those sets of issues is, 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 is absolutely key. So it's a, it's a really important thing. And it's the thing we can change really rapidly as well. So yes, important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do you um do you oh, no, 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 I'm sort of mic'd up here. Do you have um Rita um, Rita Sido's uh, email address?